Dr. Jack Rasmus is a professor of economics at St. Mary's College in California. He is a prolific author with two books published in 2016 by Clarity Press, Systematic Fragility in the Global Economy and Looting Greece, A New Financial Imperialism Emerges, and most recently, Central Bankers at the End of Their Ropes, Monetary Policy and the Coming Depression, also by Clarity Press. His latest project, Alexander Hamilton and the Origins of the Federal Reserve, will be published in mid-2018 by Lexington Books. Dr. Rasmus, welcome to Smart Talk. My pleasure. Uh, you've calculated that the actual dollar benefit of the tax cuts to U.S. businesses will amount to $4 trillion, not the $1.5 trillion estimated by the Trump administration. And critics of the tax cuts note that even before this bill was made law, the effective rate of taxation on corporations was much lower, averaging around 18%. Well, CEOs have been telling their shareholders that with the increased cash, they will simply uh, engage in stock repurchases in an effort to drive up share prices, and they'll distribute profits as dividends. There is very little talk about hiring more people, raising wages, or expanding benefits for employees. So a good place to begin our conversation is here. Uh, let me be direct. Just how bad is this tax bill for working people in the United States? Well, you know, they say the tax cut is uh, equal to $1.5 trillion. Uh, that's roughly their estimate of the deficit impact of the tax cut. Uh, the two get convoluted in the press, and people think it's a $1.5 trillion uh, tax cut. Well, actually, the taxes that are cut that are, are much, much more uh, significant than $1.5 trillion. And I would add that the deficit estimate effect of $1.47 trillion hit on the, on the budget and the deficit and the debt is also grossly underestimated. We can talk about that as a separate uh, subject, if you wish. But my estimations of this tax cut uh, is roughly as, as follows. If you uh, look at what they're even reporting, uh, the corporate and business tax cuts are $2.1 trillion. Uh, that's uh, $1.4 trillion roughly for the corporate uh, nominal rate reduction from 35 to 21 percent. Uh, that's about $300 billion more for what they call the uh, non-corporate business income pass-through uh, deduction. Um, they don't usually count uh, the last-minute uh, ACA tax cuts, Affordable Care Act tax cuts of about $300 billion. And then there's other miscellaneous tax cuts of at least $100 billion. Uh, so you're looking at uh, $2.1 trillion in the corporate tax cuts domestic, in other words, in the U.S. But the really big tax cuts come uh, from uh, U.S. multinational corporations doing business offshore. Uh, it's been estimated that uh, the Fortune 500 U.S. multinationals uh, have been hoarding about $2.8 trillion offshore. Well, that's only the 500 largest U.S. corporations. You know, if you did the Fortune 5000 or the Russell 2000 or something like that, uh, they all do business offshore. We're looking at at least $4 trillion of cash hoard uh, held offshore and not paid any taxes by tech companies, pharmaceutical companies, banks, and so forth. $4 trillion accumulated since 2005, when it was only $700 billion. Uh, by the way, in 2005, the Bush tax cuts uh, allowed companies to bring back, repatriate, as they say, uh, the taxes that they were hoarding offshore, $700 billion. Uh, they brought back about $400 billion of that. And they were supposed to use that money, corporations, uh, to invest in the U.S., expand and create jobs. Well, studies show that 90 percent of that money that was brought back in that repatriation provision uh, was really used for dividend payouts and stock buybacks and, and uh, mergers and acquisitions, 90 percent of it. Well, you know, once you establish that precedent under George Bush, 
uh, the corporations just began doing the same thing, and since 2005, accumulated about uh, officially 2.8 trillion, actually about four trillion dollars. Now, as far as tax cuts are concerned, uh, the Trump tax uh, bill uh, provides for them to bring back <clears throat> that income once again, uh, but at tax rates of between eight percent and 15 percent instead of the 35 percent. You see, uh, there's a foreign profits tax, 35 percent, but no one's been pay, paying that uh, since Bill Clinton uh, allowed them to check a box on their tax returns in 1997 uh, in which they could just keep it there and not pay any taxes on it. Well, you know, they engage in intra-company pricing to uh, book their profits offshore, and they kept them offshore. So now this Trump tax bill uh, they can bring it back between 8% and 15%. 8% uh, if it's uh, uh, non-cash a- assets and 15% if it's cash. Well, they're going to convert a lot of the cash to uh, uh, non-cash uh, liquid assets at 8%. And uh, to the extent that they bring it back, uh, they're only going to have to pay maybe 10 12%. Let me well, ask you. Let me ask so you. Wait, wait, wait. Um, it occurs to me, other countries, the governments of other countries are going to have to respond in some way to, to this uh, change in U.S. tax law. Do you have any indication of where countries like the United Kingdom or France or Germany or Japan or even China uh, might uh, change their own tax laws accordingly? Well, they've already begun, they've already begun to do so. Uh, in Europe, uh, the move is on uh, to tax uh, these tech companies and pharmaceutical companies and so forth. So, and in China, they've already announced they're they're going to look at the tax structure as well. So, uh, you know, what Trump has done is uh, set off a, a global corporate race to the bottom, tax right. cut to the bottom, very similar to what's been going on in U.S. Uh, at the state level. There's been a corporate uh, uh, tax cut race to the bottom. Uh, corporations in the U.S. Uh, don't pay income taxes of more than two or three percent. Uh, now, so uh, now we got the globalization of that corporate race to the bottom. But to get back to my estimates uh, of the total picture of the corporate business tax cuts, uh, you got 2.1 trillion in uh, official acknowledged uh, tax cuts for businesses and corporations. But then this repatriation uh, is going to produce another one trillion dollars of tax savings in just 2018. Uh, the estimate is it's going to generate income of uh, $338 billion. Uh, well, yeah, that, uh, that represents what they'll bring back. But what they don't bring back, and they should bring back if they were to pay 35%, would be a savings of a trillion dollars. Now, that's just in 2018. What we got is the next nine years – of the territorial tax, well, they, where they will pay eight to fifteen percent. That's at least another trillion. So, just in corporate business tax cuts, uh, you've got over four trillion dollars. And by the way, that's not even counting provisions for accelerating depreciation write-offs, or ending the corporate uh, alternative minimum tax, or the gaming of the business income pass-through provision that's going to happen. That everyone acknowledges is going to happen. Uh, so that's going to be more than $300 billion in cuts. How much more? We'll see how much gaming. So we're really looking at 4 to $5 trillion in corporate tax cuts. Now, they claim they're going to raise uh, corporate taxes uh, by uh, reducing deductions and so forth. And that will be maybe, uh, you know, another trillion dollars. Uh, but at the same time that they do that, you know, we have these other loopholes that aren't being touched at all, like carried interest, like inversions where companies move offshore and save a big, big taxes, you know, book their profits uh, in the Cayman Islands or in uh, Bermuda or in Ireland or in Netherlands and so forth, and all these loopholes uh, that they call like uh, uh, the, the, the Dutch double and, and, the, and the Irish uh, this or that, you know, uh, the, the, the corporate tax lawyers make, make jokes about the, the, the stuff that it's uh, you know, so lucrative. And you know, Apple and Google and all these guys uh, take big advantage of this. So, so these other loopholes aren't touched at all. They're going to continue in this. So, you know, I just thought corporate 
the business side, we're looking at four to five trillion net tax cuts for businesses over the next decade. And that's not even counting individual income tax cuts, which is a separate, separate matter. Those, those statistics paint a very dismal future uh, looking forward. And certainly, you, you mentioned earlier the impact on the national debt, the possibility. Well, you've stated you think the tax bill result in a dramatic increase in both the deficit and the national debt. Um, you know, one big question with all these tax cuts is how does government service that debt? Yes, well – you know, you you got to put the Trump tax cuts in uh, in perspective, historical perspective. Uh, we've been cutting taxes in the U.S. at a massive rate for at least 15 years. Uh, the Bush tax cuts amounted to uh, uh, in 2001 and three, and amounted to about 3.4 trillion dollars uh, over the decade. 80 uh, percent of which went to the world wealthiest uh, households, 5% households, and then, of course, there was this repatriation tax bill and oil and energy tax cuts in 2005 and six. So, you know, taxes were cut under Bush about $4 trillion. Uh, and then Obama comes in office, and we have uh, $300 billion in its recovery program in two, 2009, uh, and then he extends the Bush tax cuts uh, another two years at the cost of $450 billion a year. He passes another $800 billion in 2010. And then in 2013, he agrees to extending the Bush tax cuts another 10 years at a cost of about $5 trillion. So under Bush and Obama, you know, about 5 to $6 trillion under their two terms, uh, 10 to $12 trillion. And now we got Trump doing the same thing. It seems every time we get a president, uh, he cuts taxes about $5 trillion. Well, that's a big part of our, our, our deficit and our debt, uh, plus the slow economic growth where tax revenues decline, means that taxes account for at least two-thirds of our total increase in, in deficits and the national debt in this country, in which it's doubled at, since 2008 alone, it's doubled uh, to $20 trillion. Uh, so, you know, the rest is uh, a war spending, you know, in the Middle East, and uh, rising costs of, uh, of prescription drugs and medical costs to the government, you know, through Medicare, Medicaid, Part D, drug bill, and all that. Uh, you add all that up in interest on the debt, and that's the cause of your $20 trillion debt. Now, the Trump tax cuts are going to exacerbate that significantly. Well, I guess I would, I would have to say that you would be a strong critic of what has been called supply side tax cuts as bad, bad economics and even worse public policy, correct? Yeah, supply, supply side uh, is, is this nonsense intellectual creation that does not, uh, uh, it, it doesn't exist in reality. Supply side means if you cut taxes on producers, businesses, and their employees. If you cut taxes, you will give them an incentive to expand investment. And as they expand investment and production, it will mean you will generate even more tax revenues than you lost from the tax cuts. Well, there's no evidence empirical of this at all. Right. You know, in, in 1986, uh, they, they cut uh, corporate ta tax rates uh, from uh, 40, 48% or something like that to uh, 35%. Now, of course, we're going from 35 to 21, and it didn't generate any real asset investment, meaning investment in real things, making goods and services and so forth, which should be distinguished from investment in financial assets like stocks and bonds and derivatives that generate uh, no income, no tax income, because there's no financial taxes, no financial asset taxes. Uh, so... What happened in, in 1986, and, and the empirical data is very clear, it did not result in an increase in real asset investment. Uh, of course, many things determine real asset investment, so it's hard to even separate out the tax effects alone. Uh, but it's pretty clear that we didn't get a boost in real asset investment uh, and therefore productivity and job creation. And uh, that, that's true throughout the 90s. We did it in 1997, and we did it in 2001 and 3, and we did it in 2009, 10, 11, and now we're doing it again. And there's no empirical evidence of a direct causal relationship between business investor tax cuts 
and real investment in real things, there is a causal relationship and a strong correlation between tax cuts and investment in financial assets and right. mostly financial asset markets like stocks and bonds and derivatives and foreign exchange. That's very strong. Am I, correct, am I correct that prior to 1986, the tax code provided for investment tax credits when there was a direct investment in capital goods creation? So that was eliminated with this idea of just reducing marginal tax rates across the board, which led to the effects that you've just described. Yes, well, you know, the investment tax credit uh, really has its origins uh, under Kennedy in the 60s, and then it was uh, reintroduced under uh, under Nixon, uh, and and then uh, it was reintroduced uh, under uh, under uh, uh, Reagan. However, what Reagan, while Reagan Reagan's tax cuts in eighty one, eighty two, and eighty six required uh, that it has to be invested in real assets right. uh, to claim the tax credit, uh, Reagan said, uh, "You corporate America can claim it anywhere in the world." You see, so it was an incentive. Uh, to invest offshore and still get the tax cut. And uh, to the extent that uh, people supported it, uh, uh, they supported uh, the offshoring of the jobs at the same time because that, that's what began happen, happening is significantly during the Reagan period and has continued ever since. Well, we've had we've had a long history, really since the end of the Second World War, of confidence in, in fiscal and monetary policy to stabilize the boom to bust cycles that we've experienced. And and I and I, my research indicates that we've had eleven recessionary downturns just since the end of the Second World War. Um, in a recent article that I read on your website, you wrote about the nature of business cycles and you wrote the economics has to date uh, been hard pressed to identify the underlying causes. Uh, would you explain to our listeners what you meant by the existence of a mutual feedback effect between profits and investment and what this tells us about business cycles? It's something I hadn't read before. Right. Well, you know, uh, you need to distinguish between real asset investment and financial asset investment. Uh, real asset investment, of course, as I said, is net private uh, domestic capital creation, right? Uh, and creates jobs, hires real people because you got to make real things and provide real services. Financial asset investment is simply investing in stocks and bonds and derivatives, you know, and doing so around the world in foreign exchange and so forth, right? It doesn't create any jobs. Or uh, wealth. Or wealth. Well, it, it creates wealth uh, if you... Not material wealth. It doesn't create any material wealth, as Henry George would define it. You know, capital goods, actual That's capital right. goods. That's right. It doesn't create any any real wealth, but it does create uh, money wealth for those who speculate in those financial asset markets. Now, the problem with mainstream economists is uh, they don't understand uh, financial uh, assets and financial investing. You see, they are, they are trained in, in the 1930s national income product accounts or GDP accounts. You go to GDP uh, uh, data in the Commerce Department, Bureau of Economic uh, Analysis Affairs, and uh, wh what do you find? You don't find any financial asset variables there. In fact, they exclude stock market and bond prices uh, from calculating GDP. Well, these economists are trained in looking at only those variables, and their models like the DSGE models and so forth do not really account for financial instability and financial cycles and the impact of financial cycles on real cycles. You know, uh, the real economy, especially in the last several decades, and especially in the 21st century, is more and more weighted towards financial asset investing. And that's very unstable. Financial investing is very unstable, very volatile. And what we saw in 2008-9 is a crash in the banking and financial system that then provoked a crash in the real economy. It spilled right. over and dragged down the real economy. Right? Well, that's very clearly you know, what caused that financial crisis. Uh, and mainstream economists uh, aren't very good at understanding uh, financial assets and financial cycles. And I'm arguing you have to understand the drivers of financial asset investment and how it impacts real asset investment and how the two feed back on each other 
uh, one exacerbating the other when you start to get a downturn. Uh, they, they don't do this. They don't understand this. You know, Paul Krugman and others say, well, what happened in 2008-9 was a great recession, as if great simply meant uh, worse than a normal recession, the 11 you referred to, uh, but not as great as the Great Depression of the 1930s. Well, that's explanation by adverbs, you see. That doesn't tell you anything. In my 2010 book, Epic Recession, I used a different term, epic, uh, I quantify and, and, uh, and look at the qualitative differences uh, between, quote, epic recessions like 2008-9, uh, which are seriously worse than the normal recessions, uh, but aren't yet quite depressions. And I argue historically, if, if you look at 1907-14, that was an epic recession provoked by a financial crash and real Fiscal monetary policy could not deal with it, and we had seven years of stagnation and falling into re-recessions several times. And if you look at 1929-30, that started out as an epic recession as well, again provoked by financial crisis. And it got much worse and descended into a depression because we had a sequence of further banking crashes, four of them in fact, that followed upon the stock market crash in 1929 and kept dragging the real economy deeper, deeper, deeper. And it wasn't until we got significant banking reforms in 1933-35 that the depression stopped going deeper. Well, 2008-9 was an epic recession that got stopped and prevented from going into a depression, but it cost the central banks globally – Twenty-five trillion dollars to stop the global banking crash. As as you know from uh, our previous communication, I I was at Fannie Mae f during that period of time and worked there as a business manager and market analyst. And of course, one of my responsibilities was to take a look at what was happening to the property markets. And because of my familiarity with Henry George's analysis. I was looking at land prices and what was happening to land prices, and I think this is a big gap in mainstream economics, even in the, the national income accounts. The analysis of rent in our economy is, is grossly understated. I, I was looking at the period, for example, during the 1990s, when if you looked at property appraisals, the land to total value component kept increasing annually almost by double digits, so that by the time... I left, which was 2005, in many parts of the country, 50 or 60 percent of the value of properties being purchased was in the land, which means that, that a lot of financing was, was provided for land acquisition as opposed to the acquisition of actual housing. And blame Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac for the financial crisis. In a major way, increasing the maximum loan limits in order to accommodate the market. Because as this process occurred, as the median price of housing escalated, people were having a, a very difficult time saving to make minimal down payments. And what we did was constantly lower the cash down payment requirements. We lowered the amount of, of uh, savings you had to have after closing. We expanded the credit worthiness standards, et cetera, et cetera. All that contributed to the, to the problem. And then you throw in on top of that the dramatic escalation in the subprime mortgage market that was fueled by the bank's uh, putting together private label mortgage-backed securities and selling them on Wall Street as AAA bonds when they were really mostly junk bonds. So in addition to all the things you've described, I think economists need to look much more closely in more detail that how the land market operates and how, how credit-fueled speculation contributes to this dynamic. Uh, several comments on that, uh, which I, I agree with, but... <clears throat> What you're talking about is, is uh, uh, how land and properties play a big role in financial speculation, uh, always. If you look at the Great Depressions we've had in this country, they've always been precipitated by property bubbles and collapses. Uh, 1837, uh, canal building and so forth, property speculation uh, crashed and caused a seven-year depression. Right, 1872, 
uh, railroad land speculation at the center of the whole thing. Uh, 1890s, uh, once again, speculation not only in railroads, railroad land, uh, but also in, in other assets, um, uh, you know, holding companies and so forth. 1907, same thing. 1929, uh, you're right. Uh, economists do not give enough credit to the collapse in farm land values in the 1920s and the overbuilding cycle that occurred in the mid to late uh, uh, 1920s in the big cities. And moving forward to uh, what happened here most recently, uh, the housing cycle began in 1997. I'm talking about residential, to some extent commercial. And it had pretty much run its course uh, by 2002. In other words, people who could really afford to buy. But in 2002, the economy was not recovering very well. So Bush and uh, Greenspan, the Fed chairman at the time, uh, agreed to lower interest rates even more. And they turned a blind eye to the practices, some of which you note here, uh, in the housing industry, the subprime mortgage bond uh, uh, loan, loan situation, uh, the uh, uh, liar's loans, uh, 100%, you know, didn't need an income, you know, 1% uh, uh, teaser rates and, uh, uh, you know, all the other, uh, let's just write these mortgages and, and then sell them to other investors. Let's chop them up in tranches. Uh, and, and securitize them and sell them and put them in uh, uh, mortgage-backed bonds. And then you take your mortgage-backed bonds and you combine them with, with ABSs and you create CDOs. And CDOs, you go to CDSs. In other words, derivatives. Yes. The property problem that began in 2007 here, uh, subprime mortgages at the heart of it. But what happened was that those subprime mortgages, when they started crashing, pulled down all the derivatives associated with them in AIG and Lehman and elsewhere, and that caused the entire credit system to freeze up. Now we got a similar problem going on today. Not so much in in the residential property, but commercial property, we have a similar pro similar problem uh, going on, and we have. Uh, in the stock market, we have uh, exchange-traded funds, ETFs. ETFs may be the next subprime mortgage bond problem uh, when you link ETFs and how they're driving up the stock market bubble, which is, which is growing here in the U.S. and, China and uh, Japan and Europe. Uh, watch out for ETFs and the stock market because it's playing the same derivative. ETFs are just derivatives. You know, they're like the CDOs. And, and uh, MBSs of 2007-8. Uh, but it's a repeat. It goes on and on because uh, we don't have much regulation of the financial system. Uh, and economists, once again, don't understand much of this because they are trained in non-financial variables and their models don't incorporate these key non-financial uh, 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 factors. Uh, that's why, you know, when the crash came in 2007 uh, none of them could predict it. There were just a handful, you know, Schiller and a few others who knew what was happening because they were looking at housing and property prices. Uh, so to answer your question, to sum up, yes, property is always uh, at the heart of it because it becomes a financial asset that's very price volatile. It's a favorite price speculation uh, once it gets overheated. Uh, and it's always associated with financial crashes. And qualitatively, 2008-9, an epic recession, is more like a depression that got stopped right, uh, than normal recessions that we've had in the past. Now, the 21st century, we're moving more and more as it becomes more financialized uh, into these financial instability. I talk about this. It's in great detail in my 2016 book, Systemic Fragility in the Global Economy, where I talk about the relationship between debt and the ability to finance the debt and other non-financial factors uh, uh, related to, to uh, uh, debt conditions and uh, debt terms and conditions like covenants and picks and so forth. Uh, it's really a model of uh, how financial fragility grows in the system and then eventually precipitates 
a financial instability event, and if it's big enough, uh, it will bring down the rest of the economy. Uh, well, Dr. Rasmus, it sounds like we're at a point in uh, public policy analysis where economists are not providing the kind of uh, input that our politicians really need to come up with the right sort of economic policies. We're, we're stuck between two things. We're stuck between going back to the neoclassical uh, theory, and we're stuck between uh, uh, you know, sort of embracing Keynes and what the Keynesians have had to say. And yet, for example, with, with Keynes, the, the economists who embrace Henry George's analysis have looked at Keynes and said, his big mistake was he did not understand the power of land markets. Uh, he really just sort of thought that agricultural land was all there was and never recognized the problems with the skyrocketing price of urban land and, and urban land rents and how this is channeled into higher location costs for businesses and the general population, even people that need a residence. Uh, like, you know, it's most impossible for anyone to afford a house anymore in London. Uh, and in many other centers around the world, Hong Kong. The absence in Keynesian analysis of an appreciation for what happens in land markets means that, that, that we don't really have an economic theory, a good appreciation for how rent claims uh, wealth produced by those who are the produ productive segments of our societies. And so public policy, not recognizing the, the importance of rent, uh, you know, maybe right now Joe Stiglitz is one of the main economists who keeps talking about the, the destructive power of rent seeking and even of rent seeking where land speculation has occurred. But it is not a general part of economic theory being taught and utilized. And I wonder, you know, whether or not you see any potential change so that economics can begin to really describe what's happening in the real world. Well, uh, when you use the term uh, rent, uh, I, I agree with you if by rent you mean uh, um, uh, speculation, uh, money on money, uh, not just on land. Uh, it's not just land rent, of course. Even the classical economists distinguish between land rent and rent in general. Uh, and yes, uh, rent, uh, the way you use the term rent is close to what I mean by financial asset speculation, uh, where money is made off of securities by securitizing them and reselling them and repackaging them uh, and from financial asset investing where nothing's really made, uh, rentier, rentier uh, uh, businesses uh, are uh, really uh, speculators, financial speculators, and they don't really produce anything. They make money from money, you might say. Uh, and uh, as far as Keynes is concerned, you've got to distinguish between Keynes and Keynesians, you see. Uh, what purports to be Keynesians today are really uh, hybrids, hybrids of uh, pre-Keynes notions that Keynes argued against and some of Keynes himself. Uh, again, in my Systemic Fragility book, I have a, a third of the book, 500 pages, is devoted to a critique of uh, contemporary mainstream economics. And uh, in there, I introduced the concept of hybrid Keynesians, who are, as I described them, and also their counterparts that I call retro classicalists, who try to uh, uh, re resurrect the equation of exchange, quantity theory of money in fancy form here, Milton Friedman and all the rest. Right? Uh, and uh, that's what we got today. Uh, retro classicalists, the various uh, offshoots and schools, and uh, hybrid Keynesians who aren't really Keynes. Uh, if you go back to Keynes, you're right in general, but in the general theory, his main book in 1935, there's a chapter, chapter 12, that sort of is an aberration. It stands out, uh, you know, like it doesn't belong there. The rest of the book is really, uh, you know, national income account type analysis of variables. Uh, but that chapter 12, he's talking about financial speculation. Uh, it's undeveloped, right? And it's that particular chapter, by the way, that the later economist, Hyman Minsky, develops further. And uh, it's very interesting, the, the potential uh, in that chapter for an analysis of rentier capitalists and rentier uh, 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 companies. He calls 
calls that uh, speculative enterprise as opposed to uh, real enterprise, which produces things. He doesn't really take it further in the general theory. He has that chapter that sticks there, and then he doesn't go further with it uh, to explain how it interacts. In other words, how financial cycles and speculation in Chapter 12 interacts with real business cycles, investment, and so forth elsewhere in the book. That's missing. It's sort of like a, 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 a light at the end of the tunnel. He plugs in there in the general theory, but takes it no further. And it's up to Minsky to come along in the 70s and 80s to take it a little bit further. But even Minsky was too early. You see, the financialization uh, of, of the economy was just globally, was just really beginning to accelerate in the 80s and 90s. And Minsky dies in 95. Right. And there really isn't anybody... And I guess I'm trying to pick up, uh, you know, uh, where they left off and talk about how financial cycles and financial speculation and rent would be included in that, not just land rent, but rentier investment, uh, interacts with real cycles and real business. And how I argue that over time, what we see is real asset investment being not as profitable as financial asset investment, and therefore money capital is flowing out relatively of real investment to financial asset markets. And that explains why over the long run we're seeing a decline in real asset investment and therefore productivity decline, which contributes to wage compression and stagnation as well. In the tax system, it seems the conclusion that you would reach is that uh, the reduced tax rates on so-called capital gains is actually uh, a, a gift to businesses as opposed to we ought to have a very low tax rate on actual wages from and salaries uh, and a much higher rate on gains on the sale of financial instruments. Would you agree? Yeah. Yes, I would agree with that. And, you know, fundamentally, uh, what we got, got with all this tax cutting going on, particularly since George Bush, $15 trillion now in the U.S. alone, right? Uh, what we got is a subsidization of financial investing and to some extent real investing. It's a subsidization. Uh, you know, the, the, the Trump tax cut, it's estimated, will boost uh, – disposable income for businesses between 10 and 31 percent. Uh, that's a windfall. That's an immediate windfall of profit, quote, profit increase of 10 to 30 percent in one year. Well, if businesses are going to be able to make their profits through tax cutting, uh, what's the incentive for them uh, to be competitive and to make their profits uh, the old-fashioned way? And if a lot of this, this tax cutting ends up in uh, dividend payouts, which it does, and stock buybacks, which it does, both of which cause bubbles in stock markets and bond markets, uh, and or hoarding or offshoring of this. And now we're going to have uh, a diversion of these tax cut revenues, um, not only in, into continuing buybacks and dividend payouts and sending the money offshore by multinational corporations, but we're going to have a massive merger and acquisition wave coming. That's already being planned. You know, uh, the pharmaceutical companies and the tech companies and the banks, uh, you know, they're already stumbling over each other, and the private equity firms are, you know, licking their chops. Uh, this is where all this, uh, the, the lion's share of all this tax, tax cuts going to go. So the fiscal tax cut system is fueling uh, a, a, a diversion of money capital from real asset investment into financial asset investment, which causes more and more financial bubbles. And when the bubbles break in 2008-9, we know what happens. And that's coming, I predict, in two to three years. Well, that that's a pretty uh, scary prediction. Even the uh, economists who, who have looked at Henry George's analysis on business cycles look at it about eight, every 18, 20 years. So they're forecasting uh, if 2010 was the trough, 
and we're about 2028 for the next serious downturn. But as you say, all of these machinations that have occurred with with the changes in regulation and tax law may bring it about much sooner. And it's and it, there are many scary uh, aspects to the, the economy that we could talk about. You know, for example, the delinquencies on automobile financing are, are skyrocketing. Uh, there are many, many foreclosures still every year. We we don't hear a little, lot about the residential foreclosure crisis, but but that's still occurring in many parts of the United States and even other countries. Um, but well, you know, the, the the key there is the debt run up. You know, uh, we have this massive debt run up globally. Uh, the, the the magnitude of debt is worse than it was in two thousand seven eight. Uh, U.S. households have not. Uh, or run down their debt. Uh, you know, we got like uh, over a trillion dollars in student debt, over uh, a trillion dollars in credit card debt, over a trillion dollars now in auto debt, seven, eight trillion dollars uh, still in, in mortgage debt. Uh, U.S. consumers are tapped out. And the only way, way they are keeping consumer c- consumption going is to pull money out of their savings. The savings rate's barely 3% now, uh, and or buying on debt. Uh, well, that can't go on forever. Households are already fragile in terms of the relationship between their income to service their debt level. That's what fragility really is. Uh, and businesses are the same. Uh, you know, And this is where the central bank and its super low interest rates for seven, eight years also plays a role in precipitating financial bubbles and the next crisis. Uh, the low rates have allowed corporations to issue massive amounts of uh, uh, investment grade and junk uh, junk debt. We're talking about trillions of dollars in the U.S. alone and globally as well. Uh, you know, there there is probably over $10 trillion in non-performing bank loans still uh, globally, and we've issued tens of trillions of dollars of new corporate debt. And, of course, we know the government debt has uh, doubled in the U.S. and elsewhere as, as well. So we got this massive debt accumulation since 2008-9. We haven't solved anything there. In fact, it's worse. Now we have income that's been growing nicely for corporations and barely growing for households and being cut for, for uh, governments. But when you get a crash in your financial asset prices, when the bubbles crash, then the ability – to finance the level of debt that's built up uh, cannot be sustained. And then you have defaults, and then you have the crisis, you see. Uh, The cycle of defaults everywhere. I I wonder if you had an invitation to present your analysis at at Davos at the World Economic Forum. (laughs) No, I don't think so. They're all part of the... uh, you know, it's, it's like the Titanic has left New York. Yeah. Uh, and they're all partying, uh, you know, and, and saying, oh, the global growth, uh, uh, you know, economic growth has, has recovered. Uh, uh, yes, it has a little bit. The animal spirits uh, have returned. Uh, but a lot of the global growth is a consequence of China in 2015 and 16 stimulating its economy, a lot of it. And now China as signal, it's pulling back on that stimulus and it's going to try to deal with its uh, shadow bankers and speculators. Uh, so those uh, forces there uh, are, are going to dissipate. Uh, I, I, I think uh, 2018 will, will, will not be a, a GDP growth in the advanced economies anywhere near what we had in 2017. And I think in 19, uh, it'll be even even less. So it's, it's a temporary thing that's going on in terms of global growth. But they think it's going to be forever. And, of course, they think that stock markets are going to continue and the r- rise forever. Uh, you know, and, and the frenzy and financial speculation, you know, is really obvious with all the cryptocurrencies. And you can see cracks in some of the uh, edifices here with some of the defaults. GE is in trouble General Electric uh, is in trouble. Uh, Carillion uh, collapsed in, in uh, the UK. Steinhoff in Europe. Uh, you know, these are early signs, I think, of, uh, of uh, imminent defaults that are coming. As soon as the stock market corrects and asset prices 
re retract, uh, where you're going to see a big change in risk-off uh, psychology, and that's going to spill over to the real economy, as these financial crises always do now. It's not really uh, the kind of creative destruction that uh, Schrumpeter was talking about, is it? No, well, no. There, there are so many issues we could talk about, and unfortunately, we have a limited amount of time to do so. I hope that Smart Talk will invite you back again so we can continue this conversation. I have a couple of questions for you that I really I think our listeners would love to hear your views on. Uh, today, there's 10.7 percent of wage and salary workers that belong to labor unions. Membership is really unbalanced there. 34.4 percent in the public sector and just 6.5 percent in the private sector is the primary cause changes in legislation or changes in the attitude of workers toward unions. What do you think? Uh, well, it, it's a complex uh, phenomenon. It's certainly not changes in attitude towards unions because surveys show more and more people, particularly young people, millennials, are favorable to unions. Uh, the unions haven't been able to capitalize on that and, and really organize them uh, because uh, of a number of factors. Uh, a lot of uh, people are in what's called contingent uh, labor or service jobs, part-time, uh, very hard to organize. Uh, and uh, leadership in the unions, uh, many of them, about all of them, have their, uh, uh, you know, they're looking in, in, uh, through the rear view <laughs> mirror, uh, you know, where things were, and relying on the Democrats to save them, which they aren't. Uh, th the problem goes back to the 1970s, you see. In, in 1970-71, unions were very successful. Uh, there was a big strike wave, uh, the last one, and unions, uh, people in union contracts, you know, construction and manufacturing and, and transport were getting 20% increases in wages and benefits, 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, and what business did was immediately reorganize. Uh, Nixon put a wage freeze on, and business reorganized and went on the counteroffensive, uh, took on the construction unions and busted them. Uh, and then uh, uh, under Reagan, of course, uh, anti-union attitudes and uh, legal uh, uh, new legal developments made it harder to organize. And then the offshoring of jobs completely uh, debilitated the manufacturing sector where uh, unions were strongest, right? Uh, you offshore the jobs with tax and free trade and so forth, uh, you know, you, you destroy the unions, which they effectively did, uh, which left, uh, and, and then it, it just continued over the years through, through the 90s. Uh, and so what you get, uh, I think, in the private sector is something like 6% unionized. Right. And then in the public sector, you know, there's still like 30%, and that's how you get your average. Well, the public sector, you can't offshore it, see? And public not sector, so easily. Not so easily. And public sector unions have more of an influence on local governments, so you, you can't get into union busting. Uh, so all these things have played a role in the decline of union unionism and, of course, the ability – coming out of a recession for workers to recoup their wages they lost during the recession, which unions often did, uh, and the union wage differential with non-union was strong, now it isn't. Uh, so part of the reason uh, that we have this uh, relative wage stagnation uh, since 2008-9 is, is the decline uh, of the effectiveness of, of unions. But okay. uh, it, it's a big problem. Let me go on to another uh Totally unrelated issue, or, or maybe not so unrelated. And uh, I've, I've been listening to uh, a lot of the lectures given by Professor Richard Wolff, uh, formerly of the University of Massachusetts, now at the New School. And he describes himself as a Marxist, uh, but he has a very uh, unique view of what Marx was teaching. And part of that has led him to really become a strong advocate of the formation of cooperative enterprises. Uh, and he points, as many people do, to the successful experiment in cooperatives in Spain at the Mondragon Federation. Uh, and yet in the United States, there are only about 300 cooperatives, and they employ about 3,500 people. How do we jumpstart? What do we need to do to jumpstart interest in forming cooperatives, which is certainly a, an important response to the kind of financial capitalism you've been describing? 
Well, I am not an advocate of producer cooperatives, and I think uh, Professor Wolf is wrong. Okay? Really? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Uh, you, you're not. It, it's not a strategy and the tactics to make any significant change in in the situation we have in the U.S. And it's a misreading of Marx, I think. Uh, and uh, you know, in Mondragon, in Spain, and so forth, only exist because you have the the, the support and the subsidization to some extent of local government. Uh, wherever producers' cooperatives uh, may succeed or work through self-management, it's only if you have uh, state institutions uh, supporting it. And, of course, we do not have that in the U.S., and we will not have that in the U.S. under the current system uh, that we got. Uh, I don't believe that uh, pushing producer cooperatives is going to change a thing. It's a wrong strategy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think we're, we're kind of diverting ourselves from what really needs to be done uh, to make changes to improve the, the, the lot of working folks in this country, uh, which is, uh, you've, for example, what, what I propose in my book, Central Bankers at the End of the Rope, is, is, to, is to democratize the Federal Reserve, the central bank, which now serves bankers. Uh, in the book, I describe how central banks are the creation of private banks originally and have served private banks all along uh, the way in the last 200 years. Uh, and what we got to do is, is uh, democratize it, take it out of the hands of the bankers and make the central bank serve the interests of the general population by providing, uh, you know, cost-only loans and so forth. It's part of the public banking, perhaps, uh, initiative. Uh, I think that will benefit far more people. And you can read my, my book, Central Bank is the End of the Rope. Uh, the appendum has a con constitutional amendment proposal and enabling legislation in order to uh, create central banks in the public interest rather than in the interest of bankers and the financial institutions and their politicians in the government, which they always have been. I, I think that's a, a, a much more uh, effective way of improving a lot of folks. And, of course, you've got to change the fiscal system, as we've been talking about, right. the tax system. Uh, you, you, you've got to uh, uh, look more at disposal. how you're going to service disposable income for uh, you know, the households of this, of this country and boost consumption once again. Uh, there are other ways, uh, and of course that has to require a political movement, uh, because I think the two parties here, we have Republicans and Democrats, are just two wings of one party now. Their policies aren't that different. This isn't uh, the Democratic Party of FDR. Uh, this is a different animal since, since Bill Clinton. Uh, and uh, I think we need a, a new independent uh, political party based on a real Democratic grassroots movements. Uh, that would propose a totally new um, uh, program uh, and contend for electoral power and power elsewhere in the system. And that's going to bring about more change for more people than proposing producers co-ops. Well, uh, I don't think it's going to work at all. It's an, it's an academic have... exercise, producers co-ops. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I think the jury is still out on whether or not cooperatives can be more uh, substantial player in the in the economy uh but i, I understand your point of view only in, me, small niches, only in small niches here and there where the community groups and the community supports them you see only and not in production you know yeah. they can't compete they can't compete uh, on a on a uh, economy of scale uh in in the arena of capitalist production they can't and gaining access to capital would, is certainly a big challenge for cooperatives to bring them to scale. But let me let me follow up on your your discussion about the central bank uh, in terms of monetary reform. Now, two two of the, the the main proposals by monetary reformers these days seem to be a combination of public banks, the state banks, even even public banks started by cities, and the other is the actual elimination of the power of the Federal Reserve to issue legal tender currency and have the federal government directly uh, spend currency into circulation, thus removing, you know, debt money, as, as it was be called, would be called. So what, what would, what's your feelings on the potential for those two measures 
to have a, a, a positive impact. Uh, don't confuse central banks as institutions with central banking functions. Okay, central banking functions will exist in all modern economies, and that they have evolved these functions over time. Uh, funding the government, being a fiscal agent for the government, uh, issuing money uh, on a monopoly basis, as you indicated, uh, because if you if you, if you don't, you, you have no control of the money supply, uh, serving as a clearinghouse for the private banking system, uh, supervising uh, the private banking system, quote, quote, supervising, and serving as a lender of last resort. In other words, bailing out the private banks uh, as they get in trouble, which they always do cyclically and periodically. Those are central banking functions. If you had no Federal Reserve, the Treasury would be doing the same thing. You see, you have to have central banking functions. The question is, where do they reside, in what institution, and uh, who does that institution, uh, to whom is it accountable? Uh, so you can't get rid of central banking functions. Uh, and the function today, I argue in my, my latest book, isn't even lender of last resort. The function today is a constant subsidization of the banking system with super low interest rates and quantitative easing and all these other tools to keep the banks afloat and profitable, the financial system afloat and profitable. Just as we're subsidizing more and more uh, general business with tax cuts uh, and financial markets, we are now subsidizing with, with monetary policy uh, the banking system on a permanent basis. It's a permanent bailout. $25 trillion just in the central banks of Europe, Japan, the U.S. and China has been created and injected into the system, into the global economy since 2009. And as I said before, a lot of that ends up in more financial speculation uh, and bubbles. So the central banks in subsidizing and bailing out the financial system are at the same time creating the next bubble. Right. And that's where, where we're headed. It's a right. big problem. And uh, also bring us back to the fundamental question of if you're reducing taxes and reducing federal revenue, where is the revenue going to come from to service the rising debt? And, and that we don't seem to be grappling with at all. Uh, no, I mean, are, no. are we going to cut defense? Are we going to cut all of our social welfare programs so that the revenue we do raise goes to those who hold the bonds? Well, Paul Ryan and friends uh, are proposing the latter. Let's cut social spending. They want to get rid of Medicare, they want to get rid of Social Security, uh, unemployment insurance, food stamps. They want to get rid of all that uh, because they're creating a bigger deficit with their tax cuts, you see. That's what it's all about. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's where they're going next. That's the other shoe that's going to drop this year, you know, by, by Ryan and, and his uh, ideological friends uh, in Congress, the Republican Congress, the Freedom Caucus, and, and all those other, other uh, right-wing crises. Uh, well, that that's where it's going. You know that that's how they're going to deal with the debt. On the other hand, you know, you look at a, a country like uh, Japan, and its debt to GDP ratio is way over two hundred percent, and it hasn't collapsed yet, right? So you know they're saying uh, we can go a lot longer. We're only one hundred percent in the U.S. Uh, you know we could probably do one twenty, one thirty. A debt to GDP ratio and still survive, and uh, we'll use it as an excuse to attack uh, social programs and social security and so forth. So how far can they go? No one knows, but no one they're, knows. they're convinced that they're going to be able to go further. Well, let, let's wind up this, this uh, really great discussion. I've really enjoyed this, and I've learned a lot from you. Let me let me just put one other, one more issue to you that's really right timely, and that is the Trump administration's imposition of tariffs on certain goods, such as solar panels produced in China. Uh, do you think, number one, U.S. manufacturers will respond by increasing capacity, and can they bring down domestic production costs, or will prices increase and dampen the movement by businesses and residential property owners to move to solar panels and renewables? Well, you got to look at the total cost of solar, uh, the solar market uh, uh, 
you know, development. Uh, it's not just tariffs. It's not just the price of the panels. Uh, there's a lot of other costs uh, associated with it. And the question is, uh, will these tariffs uh, really uh, end up in more demand uh, for U.S.-based uh, solar, uh, solar products as opposed to China? Uh, or, or not. It d depends on the total cost picture. You know, I, I see this, this move uh, not as a way of uh, really stimulating uh, alternative energy uh, demand in the U.S., which, of course, we know Trump is not a favor of right. in, in general. So what's he doing this for? Uh, well, I think it's really uh, part of uh, the maneuvering going on uh, for global trade negotiations between the U.S. and China and uh, you know, the statement uh, yesterday by Treasury Secretary Mnuchin about, oh, we should keep the dollar low is a signal, is a signal. You see, what Trump is all about, as far as trade is concerned, is he's a free trader. But what, you know, he's raised rates, the tariffs, and he's a free trader? Yes. But he's a bilateral free trader. Trump is out to renegotiate a better deal for U.S. business in relationship to its foreign competitors, whether they're Chinese or European. That's what all this NAFTA stuff is about. We're not going to abolish NAFTA. That's what, you know, the shot across the bow to China with the solar tariffs is all about. And that's what he means by America first when he goes to Europe, to Davos, and he gives his, his speech you know, it's a warning sign. Hey, the U.S., I'm here to get a better deal. You know, I'm, I'm the wheeler dealer commercial property guy. I know how to get deals. Uh, and uh, don't worry, we're not going to get rid of free trade. Uh, it's, it's too profitable, uh, and uh, particularly for multinational corporations. And you should look at this Mnuchin statement in keeping, uh, 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 you know, the exchange rate low for the U.S. dollar as a subsidization of U.S. offshore multinational corporations, because as long as the dollar is low, their profits that they're going to bring back are going to remain high as they exchange their profits in the domestic currency into dollars. They're going to end up with more dollars that they bring back and they pay less taxes on. So, uh, you know, it's all part of. You know, the, the exchange rate trade policy uh, and, uh, and tax policy, it's, it's all one thing. And it's all one thing uh, of uh, uh, U.S. corporations and capitalists uh, going on the offensive uh, domestically and internationally as far as ensuring a bigger share of the future economy. And I think it's worth noting just because a company might have its headquarters in the United States doesn't really mean it's an American company. And, no. you know, Coca-Cola might be based in Atlanta, but it has – uh, facilities in every country, and so it's one of those companies that's going to potentially benefit by changes in the do in exchange value of the dollar. Uh, complex yeah. questions. I, I I thank you for your insights and the time you've given us uh, for joining us here on Smart Talk. Um, I'm sure our listeners have appreciated your your insights, and I look forward to the opportunity to talking with you again at some time in the future. As well. well. Thank you so much. That's it for this edition of Smart Talk. For more information on this and other episodes, please visit our website, henrygeorgeschool.org. I am Edward Dodson, and thank you for watching Smart Talk.